meningitis treatment and dilemma. And the next one is about syphilis and TB. I feel that these two topics is challenging, but at the same time, you actually get most of the facts from, from books already. And it's more beneficial if I tell you some hands-on experience, some, something that I personally feel that is useful for you for your practice in your country, or if you can apply to that. So I, I, the, first, the first talk that I'm going to talk about is the overall review of the common UVD cases in Singapore here. Because it's very different in the context of uh, each part of the world. The UVD cases in Singapore can be totally different compared to somebody uh, another uh, in US. So the thing that a lecturer from US tell you about will be quite different from what we experience locally, but the principle of the management will be the same. So I'll give you a feel of the local feel of how, what are the presentation of these cases. And feel free to raise your hand and ask questions. My talk, um, there's not much notes to take. There are a lot of slides, a lot of pictures, so feel free to come forward bring your chair forward to look at the pictures and we can talk about it very informal. We can talk and we can discuss about them. Okay, so let's start. So, whenever I face with a UVI's case, you might have come across this yesterday for the introduction. This is my personal preference. I would like to ask myself three questions. Is this infective? TB syphilis, you know, do I need to rule out those? Do I need to do a culture and sensitivity? Do a sample? Do I do a PCR in this case? Is this infective? Ask yourself. Second question I ask myself, is this condition sight threatening? Is the patient going to go blind or the patient is the vision going to be affected very soon if I don't do something about it? Because that is going to affect my management from there on. Is this a condition life threatening? Is is this a, the way that I presented to us that we as ophthalmologists has uh, if this is a systemic condition, is it the first time that we are the one, the doctor, that they come across and we have a role of, the, of uh, discovering what is their underlying problem and save their life? In fact, a lot of circumstances you might come across that. And if you listen to Dr. Vistale's yesterday's talk, a lot of time ophthalmologists is the first one to encounter and kind of channel the patient to the right treatment. And you know, we, they might, we might be the first person who, who whom you know that this patient is suffering from lymphoma and monitor from there on. There's a lot of circumstances of that. Okay, uh, these are the first three questions. Then, look at a picture like this. Is this infectious or non-infectious? It can be both. Mm -hmm. Because you see the eye. You see the hypopian. You see something funny just right here. The dilated pupil just doesn't look quite right. Okay. These are just appetizers. So, you see, a, you see a big granuloma at the far inferior part of the cornea, uh, of the fundus. I'm sure a lot of you here, in our part of the world, in Asia, you see this quite a lot. You, so you have to ask yourself, uh, get a good history examination, get the vitals, check the temperature, do a full blood count. This will help you to kind of decide whether this is infective or not infective. Okay? Do a chest x-ray, urine analysis, and if possible, it's feasible, and you do a biopsy as well. Next, you ask yourself, is this site threatening? How do you know whether it's site threatening? You check whether the lesion is close to the macula or not, or close to the disc. So you ask, you, you check VA, okay, visual acuity. You check whether there's RAP. You check, is that pressure high or pressure very low? So check the fundus, check whether there's CMO, cystic macular edema, where's the lesion, is it close to the macular optic nerve. Okay, is it life threatening? Very important. Is the patient immunocompromised? Is this a patient, you know, maybe a retroviral patient, first time presented to you with this problem? You never know, you have to ask the history very carefully. Now, um, is the patient septic? Do you need to admit the patient very quickly and seek internal physician's help to revive this patient? Is there signs of organ failure? Because later on, you want to give medication to the patient. That might affect your overall management. Is there an underlying malignancy? Yeah, and you find out. Okay? So, this is just the appetizing. I'm just running through some common cases that we come across here. Antiriritis is one of the commonest ones. Okay, we come across a lot of books. If you, if, if you don't say, try this. I prefer to stand on the Yeah. Now, we come across a lot of folks in the patient here. 
Essentially, when we say books, you know, psychiatrists, essentially you don't know what's the cause of it. Okay? It's just nice to put a name on it. It is typically presented with diffuse white static kidneys. The patient commonly presented to you with a cataract. And it is not uncommon that you actually see vitreous cells and vitreous pillars and vitreous veils at the back of the eye as well. Okay? Now, another one that's quite common here because we have the privilege and the advantage of doing aqueous tap and use the aqueous to do PCR. Now we are diagnosing more and more CMV, hypertensive, anterior uveitis. So, it's typically the KPs is cheesy looking, it's kind of greasy looking KPs. Centrally, the patient doesn't have any posterior sinusia. And CMV anterior uveitis typically causes endotheliitis. So endothelium have the same embryological origin with the trabecular meshwork. So if the endothelium is inflamed, you expect the trabecular meshwork to inflame as well. And that's why, in my opinion, that pressure usually spike when there's a acute attack. So regularly, if in doubt, if the patient is agreeable, we do any treatment tap. We put an eye speculum on it, sterilize the eye with some uh, half strength betadine. We all usually aim at the lower one third of the cornea because you want to rest just around there. You don't want to touch the lens. And you can aspirate it either with the patient lying down, lying flat on the chair. Personally, I prefer to do it on the slip lens. And sometimes you come across ampullous sign. You know what ampullous sign is? Um, is a high femur after you decompress or aqueous vein uh, when the eye is decompressed. So for an eye that has un has a long history of anterior uveitis, the iris is being shapeless to very thin. So the, the, the eye ang angular vessels are exposed. So when you suddenly decompress the eye, it tends to bleed. But usually it's quite self-limiting. Reassure the patient, make sure that you Put the patient on antibiotic and anti-glaucoma medication. See the patient in 24 hours. All my cases, the hygema resolve in 24 hours. That means the patient can see again. Initially, when the hygema occurs, the patient's vision can down, can go down the counting fingers, hand movements. But the next day, when the patient comes back, the vision just resolve. Okay, not to worry about that one. Yeah. So is the actual sign specific to FHIC or is it because I, I read in textbooks that you see it in FHIC specifically, but you see it. I see in usually so far all the MCO signs that come, they come across the tap I get the PCR review negative. They're not CMV for some reason I don't know why. So it was classically described in books, uh, but you can describe it like sometimes when you do cataract surgery on this crowd, you also get angular bleed as well. So um, I'm not sure how specific we want to label this MCO sign as. But it's good to know, for exam point of view, what is that all about. But essentially telling you that this eye has been had chronic anterior for a long, long time. That's the, that, that's the gist of it. But for some reason, all, my, all the all the tap that has high femur, after that, so far, CMV seems to be negative and they are typically put on this idiopathic. Or, or you might not have the ability to detect the germs or the virus that's causing this. Because there are certain people feel, uh, there are certain group of investigators feel that's related to develop virus and this sort of stuff. Yeah. So I typically get back a report just like this. We we call it tetraplex PCR because we check for four items, CNV, HIV, DZV, and toxoplasma. And in this case, CNV is detected. Hooray, we got the diagnosis. We're quite rare for this anyway. Okay. What do I usually manage? Okay, how do I manage this patient? I usually tell the patient, sit the patient now, say, this is a long-term relationship between you and me. I need to start you on medication as such. And you need to be on all this medication for at least six to 12 months. They have to know this from the very beginning. And you start the patient on antiviral. If it's HSV, start the patient on the ointment. I some, I, I'll top it up with uh, oral acetovir as well, because it's relatively, cheap and you don't have to give the full dose. You can give it five times a day for a little while, then you cut it down three times a day, twice a day, once a day, very gradually. You give the patient anti-inflammatory as well, 
um, I personally usually start off with giving Pet Forte, but there's other group of researchers feel that Pet Forte might be too strong. They prefer to use an NCI. That's perfectly fine as well. Give the patient anti glaucoma medication. You don't want the patient to go back thinking that you got a diagnosis and you don't cover them with anti glaucoma. I would rather treat the anti glaucoma I don't other than not because I don't want them to come back with uh, visual field deficit because I didn't treat them properly. And ultimately, if all fails, glaucoma drainage procedure, like what I, uh, Dr. Daniel Su mentioned to you yesterday. Um, we also see a lot of HLA-D27 related uveitis. They typically presented to you with a lot of posterior sinicum, a lot of fibrin in the anterior chamber. They sometimes presented to you with a hyphema, you have to look closely. And they you, you, the way I assess them is I look into the anterior chamber. I'm not sure whether from your distance you can see. I look at the cells. In an acute stage, you see a lot of cells and they're not moving in the anterior chamber. They're kind of stagnant there. And that's not a good sign. At this stage, the patient would be experiencing a lot of pain, uh, free ciliary injection because the ciliary muscle is in spasm. At that stage, if you measure the pressure between the two eyes, the eye that has the uveitis will usually, the pressure will be lower, a lot lower. Not all the time, but my experience will usually be a lot lower compared to the other eye. So that will give you an indication. And if the patient has attacked red, I mean, quite a few times already, they will be experienced enough to tell you, Doctor, I think now it's coming back again. My problem. Sometimes this patient come to you even before you can see the cells and they're accurate. Sometimes I, uh, I'll just start them on only prep for thing, even before I see all the cells. For those patients that have been following for quite some time. So when, what is a sign when your treatment start to work? The treatment start to work when the patient feels that the pain is less. When you look at this anterior chamber, the cells is start to circumduct. You see the cells floating around, up and down slowly with the heat of the eye. They cause circumduction. I think the Japanese call them uh, the heat wave or something. So, um, so that's a sign that your treatment is working. And I will encourage you to treat the patient aggressively at the very beginning. Give prep forte topical steroid hourly half hourly, at least the first two to three days, because it works better. If you just give the patient four times a day eye drop, they will still have a lot of pain. Uh, it doesn't work that well, and they will sometimes blame it on the eye drop that they think the eye is going worse. So treat aggressively at the very beginning, if you're confident that this is a non-infective uveitis, okay? Next. Do not forget to check the patient's posterior segment. Very important, because you do not want to miss out uh, a subtle CMO there. Because a lot of them come to you, some, some of them who, are, who, 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 who seek medical attention quickly, they will, will not develop it. But certain, some of them will have this grumbling for months before coming to see you. So you want to look out for CMO. So you send the patient for OCT, examine the back of the fungus. And it's not a surprise, somebody with HLA and tear you at this and you dilate the pupil, you see this. You see squiggly vessels, congested optic nerve. Sometimes you see, even see a bit of hemorrhage as well. And if you do all angiogram on all of them when it's active, we don't. But this is a, a, a few of my patients. This is actually the patient have acute anterior uveitis from HID27. And this is how their angiogram look like. So if you say it's a purely anterior uveitis, sometimes it's not. Even though it's, it's a HID27, sometimes posterior segment can be involved. But after they've been treated, this all get better. The most important thing that you need to make sure is whether there's CMO or not. That will direct you whether how aggressive you want to treat this case. Okay? Any questions so far? Am I going too slowly? Am I going faster? No? Okay. What is this? Enclosing spondylitis. You see it a lot in this part of the world. They have trouble putting their head onto the slip lamp. You need to squat them early, send them to the rheumatology, and get them get seizures before that the, the, the spine gets stiffened up. And it will be a very challenging when you want to do cataract surgery on them. You need to tilt the head down and legs up to do surgery for them. Uh, okay. 
when you examine patient, we ophthalmologists, we are still doctors. We don't just look at eyes. Look somewhere else. Look at the eyes, good enough, but make sure that we look somewhere else as well. If the patient presented with it to us with antiviritis, well, at least take a look around on their face. Look around after they show, show you the hands. Okay? Elbow. What's this condition? What did the patient have? Mm -hmm. Psoriasis, exactly. This is psoriasis, psoriasis related and period. So make sure that you know we do do a proper physical examination if need so. I'm not asking you to see all to examine all the patients in the UVS clinic, but sometimes the clues is in front of you. It's just that you sometimes too tied up, just look and sit there and then you forgot to treat this patient as a person. Sometimes we forgot, we just treat it as an eye. I in and I out. Okay? So don't forget that. Sclerides is something quite common here as well. Um, the common systemic association is what for sclerides is it for uh, rheumatoid arthritis? Top one. We see occasionally some redness during the moment. These are the if, uh, these are the autoimmune type. We see some relapsing polychondritis. Sometimes SLE can present with that. And don't forget the infective one, the hepatic one, TB, leprosy, syphilis, all can cause that as well. So it's no harm to actually just uh, do a screen on TB and syphilis especially. And we also come across quite a lot of surgically induced sclerosis. And it typically starts within three weeks after the surgical procedure. And it also can happen in cases where screen repair was done, cataract surgery, tobacconectomy, vitrectomy, RD surgery was done. Okay, don't forget about that. How do we treat them? We treat them with topical steroid, provided you have out the infectious health. We can treat them with systemic NSAIDs, Bufen, Indocid, those crowd. We can give them periocular steroid injection. It's doable. If still not responding, you can try systemic steroid. Talk to their rheumatologist and see what the rheumatologist says, and you coordinate with them. Some of them already have rheumatology history. So you just look through the list what medication the patient has been on, and usually you can modify that and coordinate that with the rheumatology. The rheumatology once tell me a very useful piece of tip. For people who are rheumatoid arthritis, as long as they are on prednisolone for more than 10 milligrams, the condition is usually controlled quite well. So a lot of my rheumatology, a lot of the rheumatoid arthritis, uh, sclerosis patients of mine, a lot of time I have to have them on a little bit more than 10 milligrams, and then I slowly taper them down to about 10. And a lot of time, if I taper down to 7.55, the problem will recur again, and that's the problem. But they're usually quite stable uh, with the steroid, the pencil above 10 mg. Can you say that if the patient has been on long term, higher than 10 mg of steroid, that's not satisfaction. You have to do something about it. I'm sure um, later on your lecture, we'll cover that. Okay? Systemic <coughs> immunosuppressive treatment, cyclosporosomite, yes. Um, you do it through the rheumatology department. Is that T, methylpinomorphotil, methotrexate, cytosporin, tetraimus, and uh, biologics, anti TNF alpha. Personally, um, if I have a choice, I feel that the anti TNF alpha actually works quite well, as long as it's not an infective, um, infective sclerosis. This is a patient of mine, rheumatoid arthritis. I'm just flashing some pictures here. Rheumatoid arthritis. And you see one, the other eye is totally red. And the patient has very poor compliance. And when you look, flip out of it, you see this huge area of scara thinning. In fact, I did a FACO for this patient already. And during the FACO emulsification, the whole lens was so wobbly, um, I had to put iris hooks to actually hang on to the capsule. I remove the lens. I remove the lens, I leave the capsule behind, I leave the patient and take it. And the patient settled quite well, even though you know, that eye without the lens can't see too well, but the eye is relatively quiet. So in, with the inflamed eye, sometimes in, when the capsule is not steady, it is, is the, when the capsule is very unstable, and the patient still have a good seeing eye the other eye, on, uh, on the, on the right eye, I'll leave it alone, because if there's no point of putting a capsule tension ring, 
and you go and secure the land or whatsoever, you're going to trigger off even more information. And if even more information, if you, want to be, if you drop the lens or drop the IOL to the back of the eye, the VR surgeon will not be very happy to you because you're going to pierce through here. Not a good idea. Yeah? This is a patient from India working in Singapore, came to me with dull, aching pain that he can't tolerate anymore. When you look up, you see all these areas of uh, injected mm, scleritis. It can make a big man cry. That's how bad scleritis is. A big man, not a macho man, they can cry for this because it's really, really painful. And if you notice that there's a lot of pain, ring a bell inside your head. This is scleritis, not the regular you know, anterior regularities, or not, not conjunctivitis. This is scleritis, it's painful and painful. The patient cannot tolerate it. So, um, how do I treat it? I treat, initially, I treated the patient with some oral steroid, and then the patient disappeared. Didn't, didn't turn out to me for almost two years. And one day, he reappeared. And he looked like this. What a face. What do you notice? What a face. Yeah, what have you been thinking? <laughs> yeah, that's right. He has been taking steroid. Where did he get his steroid from? He traveled back to his home country. And for some reason, he get hold of some steroid. And he's self-medicating himself with steroid on and off. 20 milligrams, 25 milligrams, 10 milligrams, <laughs> whenever he need. And he still didn't work. So he came back. So what did I do for a patient? I mean, anyway, I did a preliminary, I mean, initially I did some tests on him, his rheumatoid arthritis. So I sent him to get the rheumatology to look after him. I start him on infliximab. <coughs> after three doses, he's okay. I do not need to give him any more. For some reason, it's kind of settled. At the same time, the patient is being started on some low dose steroid and methotrexate as well. And he remains well. I do not need to give him any more infliximab after that. It's settled quite well. Okay? This patient, referred from my colleague, the patient had an extra capsule, cataract extraction some time ago. And my colleague told me, no matter what I do, I have the patient on prep for stay and antibiotic. This patch of weakness never go away. It, it's there all the time. My colleague said, I'm very sure that this patient is compliant because this, this patient is diabetic and he has a husband who is a former psychiatric nurse who uh, administered uh, administer the uh, drug for the patient. So I took over the patient, I bring the patient in, I did a series of tests. The patient is T-spot, TB T-spot reactive. So I looked at this, I said, nah, don't think it's TB. I will just treat this patient as sins, surgical induced uh, sclerosis. So I, I make sure that the patient doesn't walk. I make sure the patient is has the eye drop prep for it because there's a chance of non-compliance here. I also cover the patient with moxifloxacin, uh, those uh, vagomox eye drops as well, fortified antibiotic. Um, I, it didn't work. So I said, okay, fine. I start the patient on some oral steroid. The patient is, is a diabetic, so I, I get the the diabetic, because of the oral steroid, the, the control is a bit haywire, but I get in the wall and get it, get her under science still. So I don't want to steroid. And she has steroid for four weeks. Still the same. No change. Still exactly the same. So I followed the patient up for about three, two months. So I said, okay, I exhausted all my choices here. I'm going to try MDT. I sent the patient to, to our TV unit, and the patient was started on any TV, and three weeks later, I see the patient again. I'm amazed. The patient's right, is the first time ever I managed to see beyond the red patch. There's a dark area here, gelatin a bit, but the eye is a lot better. So, you know, sometimes things can surprise you, you think it's not effective, but in fact, you know, the any TV works. So learn from mistakes, like what we told you yesterday. We see a lot of BPH patients here as well. Uh, I'll leave the talk with Dr. Vasali because he's going to give, she did give you a comprehensive talk about BPH. But I'll run through some, just a very superficial description about this condition. This will be talked about, will be mentioned later on. You typically see a patient coming to you with a sudden drop of vision. He will tell you, it's a blurry region. Sometimes they found their reading glasses makes them see better. And that's because they have exudative retinal detachment and the retina is a little bit forward, so their reading glasses works better. Um, 
In fact, at this stage, you notice the eyes glowing a bit, right? And when you do an angiogram, you see a lot of starry, starry night kind of appearance where they're sort of phosphorescent leakage and they coalesce together to form a big cooling area like that. And sometimes you also see this leakage as well. And when you do an ICG, typically you can see these corridor dark dots here. Okay? Typically. And um, some enlarged and leaky corridor vessels indeed. This is uh, just, I'm showing you a lot of pictures because I feel that you know, pictures speak of a thousand words. So this is when the patient has an attack. Months later, we get a sun cap to fungus. That's because the melanocytes within the corridor has been mopped up. So you can see the red glow from the corridor vessels better. This patient came to me at the very beginning, lost all his hair. Lost all his hair from BKH. He's totally bald. After I treated him, he came back again and he has this full plate of white hair and also had poliosis as well. Recently I saw him again, I think it was like three, four, and three years after his attack, he lost all his hair again. I can't explain why. This is another Chinese patient who has chronic smoking hand urethritis, likely from BKH. He's somebody that is famous for defaulting appointment and non-compliance. So he has a right hair trap his right cataract is phacodon genetic, okay? His left lens is dropped to the back of the eye, complicated by retinotogenous retinal detachment, and we had to fix that. Well, these are the these are the um, these are leakage cases that was left untreated, the patient's non-compliant. So you, you, you end up like this. You see a bit of a vitiligo here as well. And um, there's sunset blue fungus at the back. So you might come across cases where there's no exudative retinal detachment happen. The patient just came in with poor vision. And you, you may just see condition like this. They're usually older patients. So you might, I'm not sure from your part, but you might come across cases like this. And you can put a chronic BKH as your diagnosis as well. If you are out the infective one. This is another patient of mine. I treated her because she has BKH, I treated her with steroid and she's defaulting treatment all the time. She has high pressure in the eye. She also has circumcial papillae, plenty of AC activities. Uh, she's still defaulting, so I dread the time when she comes back to me again. So, when you diagnose somebody with BKH, do keep in mind, it's a whole list of um, differential diagnosis for isolated RD, sympathetic ophthalmia, Syphilis, TB, sarcoidosis, lupus choridopathy, Lyme disease is not uh, very rare, never come across in this part of the world. Posterior sclerosis, yes. CSCR, urinary effusion syndrome, uh, intraocular lymphoma. The list go on and on, but I'm just showing you the top 10. Sometimes in pregnancy, they have the lady who has preeclampsia was very hypertensive. Sometimes they can undergo choroidal ischemia, and they also get exudative RV as well. So, not a bad idea for all the patients that come in, especially young females through a pregnancy. This is a case of any guess. It's not fair to just show you a picture and expect me to know what exactly it is. The patient has bilateral CMO. And you look at the, the, the eye, you see those dotty pigmentary changes at the back. And you do angiogram, you see all this spotty hyperfluorescent area with CMO. Infective. You have, uh, this patient has syphilitic pigmentary choroidopathy. Sometimes you call it posterior placoid choroidopathy. That will also present to you with bilateral intuitive RD or this macular when you decrease the leakage. But you need to make sure they screen it. This is a case of. CSCR, okay, typical smoke stack, frozen leakage. This is a case of this patient has SLE, lupus choridopathy. It can be very tricky to treat this cloud. Sometimes you're not even sure that you're treating a CSCR or after all or lupus choridopathy. Whether you need to give the patient immunosuppressive treatment or cut down the patient's steroid. Very tricky condition. What is this? It also can present to you with exudative retinal detachment as well. 
你知道这个你说吗？有有 wondering whether should we screen all the CSCR patients with lupus? Is this at all common? Yeah. First of all, SLE is more common in female. Our CSCR count is usually male, as far as I know. But you come across female as well because for some reason, our population here the choroid tend to have a the choroid choroid vasculation here seems to be a little bit different, and you come across more PCV here in this part of the world compared to the Western world. Um. You. I have no clear answer for it, but doing angiogram sometimes it can give you a clue whether it's lupus choroidopathy or CSCR. Because uh, in CSCR you see a very typical smoke stack. Lupus choroidopathy is just everywhere. But sometimes it's best to actually treat them as CSCR first and see whether that works. If that doesn't work, then you look into the illness. Uh, I don't think you need to screen, but if they come to this stage, they are already diagnosed, usually. They, if they come to this stage, they're usually in real failure, a lot of them. Yeah. A lot of them, not all of them. Okay, this is a patient that was being treat, referred by the general physician to us because he, the patient is, yeah, no, this patient came to see our ophthalmologist because the vision is down. And that's how it looks like at the fundus. You see this pigmentary changes here at the choroid level, and you see an inferior retinal, exudative retinal detachment here, unilaterally. Whenever you see someone brand new with the exudative retinal detachment with SRF all localizing inferiorly, if this patient is a middle age onwards, make sure that you outlook malignancy. A lot of malignancy started off if it with anxiety changes in here and sometimes if it's long enough you can see those levels but this is a lung mass and causes injury as you did RD. And it's because of eye. We saw him and it brings and then we do a systemic checkup on the patient and we found out the vision is actually from the lung. Um, this patient has a very very came to us previously has a CCF and is called uh, CCF, that means Tropical Cavernous Fistula. And uh, we treated him for that, and he came back with a swollen eye. And the back of the eye looks like that. Exudative changes. And you see stria here. And we do a OCT. You notice that there's a lot of exudative changes here. And this area is dark. The patient has posterior scoliosis. Okay, the diagnosis will not, you will not know the diagnosis just looking at the picture, but you have to go to for history. The reason for that is because she has extreme pain. Posterior scoliosis is very painful. The eye is totally chemotic, and the patient is ag in, in agony. They will, you know, they will let you do whatever you, is necessary to ease the pain. That's a telltale sign of this. Most likely, posterior scoliosis. DKH is usually not that painful. Um, the patient has this smoldering headache. Once you give them steroid, they say, oh, I feel so much lifted now. My headache is gone. That's all thing. Retinal vasculitis can be common here as well. Rule out the infective one first. TB toxoplasma typically has retinal vasculitis. Okay. And you can see you know, there's deep nerve, deep retinal hemorrhages there. And don't forget the two Ophthalmology emergency, uh, as an ophthalmologist, you have to remember there's two emergency when you're on call. Remember these two emergency, and probably three. There's two mm -hmm. right? for you guys. Come with it. Yeah. For you guys, only there's only one. ARN. Okay. Don't miss out on ARN. The earlier you treat, possibly you can save the eye. You delay it for a day, the the visual prognosis is dipping down at all the time. So if you can diagnose this early, do. Um, ARN it causes peripheral retinal necrosis, and this part of the 
the scallop tightening or the of the retina. And this part here is going to detach in due course, and it will be very, very difficult to repair it. And the patient usually lose the eye at the end of it. So the earlier you start the patient the antibiotic, the better it is. So sometimes if I in doubt, worry that this might be an early sign of um, a hepatic acute necrosis coming along, I will actually empirically start the patient on cytovia first before all the other before all the other investigative results come back. Okay. CMV. Um, the CMV for either it comes CMV or the CMV retinal retinitis. It, there are two groups of them. One of them is a HIV patient. The other group are the patients who are on long-term immunosuppression. They are usually asymptomatic, no pain in the eye. They are usually symptomatic when the lesion is coming close to the visual to the macula or to the optic nerve. Or um, the ID physician asks you to screen and then you notice that. Autoimmune. This patient has MS. You might challenge me and say, mm, maybe this patient actually has sarcoidosis. I agree, it's possible. Because this patient also presented with a seven nerve palsy as well. And that's quite typical for sarcoidosis. The patient typically has peripheral retinal vasculitis. I know I'm supposed to give a talk for intermediate urethritis. Yes, multiple necrosis they presented with intermediate urethritis. There are these peripheral retinal vasculitic changes. Like this, when you do angiogram, you see leakage. And they also have neurological signs as well, okay, for this kind of patient. And they can present you to, to you with anterior uveitis as well. And then also segment can get very cloudy. Um, intermediate uveitis is typically characterized by peripheral retinal vasculitic changes, detritus. And for this group of patients, do not forget to check whether they see CMO, okay? SLE, we have it a lot here in Singapore. Uh, our rheumatology department is flooded with a lot of these kind of cases for long term follow up. They usually have occlusive vasculopathy. This patient of mine has anti phospholipid syndrome. You see, it has these big cotton wool spots here. Uh, this hemorrhage and a huge area of ischemia here. We lasered this area here, but the patient at the moment is still under my. Uh, is, uh, I saw this patient a couple of weeks ago. The patient had a vitreous hemorrhage and we're still waiting for it to clear. This is a poor 20 odd year old Malay lady. She came in with very poor vision, both eyes. She, when we do an angiogram, this is how the eye looked like. We look, all the vessels has been occluded. You only have few viable vessels as well. That's, that's mainly, you know, at the back of the eye. This, this is SLA occlusive vasculopathy. When you do a visual field on her, severe constricted visual field. End stage, we can't do anything about it. Bachelor disease. It's uncommon in this part of the world as well. I mean, it's not, you see them all the time, but it can be a differential. Because we do come across cases like this. You can see them, they might present it to you like a CRBO or BRBO type of picture with these hemorrhages like that. The back of the eye can be totally hazy when you try this, you can't see through it. It usually involve both eyes, maybe one eye is worse than the other one. When you do an angiogram, you sometimes can see all these new vessels at the disc, CMO. In fact, this patient, I think, um, has gotten treatment, that's why you can see the back so well with angiogram. They have oral ulcers. They are, um, they are also a crowd where we can't find out the cause why the patient has this problem, we call it idiopathic. But keep in mind that you still need to review it on a regular basis so that you know, maybe one day you'll find out the cause, but not at that moment. Okay? But you treat them based on whether the condition is sight threatening or not. So the angiogram looks very dramatic like this. The CMO. Okay? And you have this ghostly, thundery, vasculitic changes at the back. This patient, when I was I was treating her, her vision was hand movements when she came in. Now, cautious when you're using systemic steroid. Why? I'll give you an example. This patient, I was treating her with unilateral right eye retinal vasculitis complicated by CMO, okay? Uh, she's not responding to orbital flaw or 
subtenal steroid. So I have to, have to give her systemic steroid. But weeks later, don't forget to look at the other eye. Because of the steroid, the patient's delivering CSR on the other eye, PED. So just be watchful when you're using steroid. Don't forget to check the other eye because you can induce a CSR from the CSR steroid that you're using, especially for patients who have rheumatological background. They use, for some reason, they have a tendency to use CSR. This is another patient. She was treated for unilateral left eye IG4, IgG4 related orbital inflammatory disease with pancreatic. This patient is from Indonesia. Indonesia, yeah. And uh, I treated her with steroid as well. As, uh, I also treated her with infliximab too. But she go back to Indonesia to get her, uh, her infliximab. And the other eye also get this as well, PED. So be careful. You are treating one eye, but you don't want to, the other eye will also get into trouble because of your treatment. Always think outside the box, okay? Like what Dr. Vasari mentioned yesterday. Don't get so cooped up, say, this is, I'm running a UVLIS clinic now. All my cases have to be UVLIS. You have to pause a little bit and think. And don't get put off by you know, science that doesn't quite make sense. Not all cases are UVLIS. You know, the referral cases to you, maybe your colleague thinks you really, but after all, it might not be. So always have to pause a bit and think, is this really you be like this? Is this really you be like this? This is a Cambodia or a lady from, no, a young lady from Vietnam came to us looking like this, the fungus. The reality is that she has hypertensive retinopathy, not you be like this. This, you come across well, in Singapore, probably it's quite rare to see this now um, because we have very, very good diabetic screening. These cases were sent to me thinking that the patient has retinal vasculitis. That's not. This patient just had very bad diabetic retinopathy with a lot of vascular sheathing, you know, ischemic patches here and there. And the patient need, the patient's sugar level is sky high. So the patient needs to be treated that way. Not a vascular disease, okay? Not a vascular disease, be aware. And I just finish off this talk of mine with this case. This is a middle-aged Malay gentleman that's referred to my department for sudden onset of right eye paracentral scotoma. The story is like this. He wake up in the morning and suddenly realize, hey, the right eye, he can see too well through it. There's a, there's a field defect just centrally. And when he went to, he has a background diabetic and hypertension. And when he he see his first ophthalmologist, the first ophthalmologist saw this and feel that, oh, this is a retinitis or maybe this is an astrocytoma type of tumor. So sent to us. Who thinks this is retinitis? I mean, if it's not, I think that's again, this is inflammatory because the vitreous is very quiet. When I take a picture, you can see through right at the back. And, and, and the edge of this region is actually well defined. If it's inflamed, it should be very fuzzy. The vessel should be all, you know, very squiggly looking and might have some exudates as well. So anyway, because of that, we keep the patient, screen the patient from top of the head down the pole, send the patient on CT thorax, abdo pelvis, do a tumor marker screen, check for, you know, I don't think the patient has a PET scan, but essentially all turn out negative. The patient still have the paracentral scotoma. Then I sit back and say, okay, what is common is common. Usually there's no, you don't come across diseases where the diabetes, hypertension, there's another one that's coming along and then that confuses the method. You just want to keep it simple. This patient has diabetes, this patient has hypertension. What kind of condition this patient, the patient who suffers from diabetes, hypertension, usually you get? Do you usually get hypertensive retinopathy? Do you get diabetic retinopathy? I go down that case. Is it possible this is a presentation of diabetic retinopathy or hypertension? Is this possible also, right? Yeah? What do you think the, I see a candidate that's nodding, nodding. What do you think that this is? Absolutely right. Hooray. You just observe. Two weeks down the road, the regions settle. So just don't forget. That's right. So thank you. We take a short break. Any questions? Yeah. Uh, in 
our institution that have luxury of PCR or tetrapex, can we still diagnose and see your patients based on clinical findings? Um, you can, you can, but sometimes I get caught up as well when I'm doing a tap. I, I will say, wow, this case, the morphology, the way the anterior chamber looks like, definitely CMV. The tap is negative. It can cut me up. But having said that, I sometimes also practice in such a way that even though the tap is negative, and, and I feel that, I strongly feel that this is still a case of CMV, I still treat the patient with anti CMV on uh, eye gel as well. The Vervan Gang Cyclovir eye gel. I just try it. Sometimes I even put the patient on oral acyclovir for a while to see whether that works. So if you don't have the facilities ability to actually check whether that is, if the drug itself is fairly reasonable to get, and it is not going to cause you any systemic, major systemic side effect, no problem trying it. Because you can, you know, you want to make sure that the pressure comes down. You want to make sure that in the, 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 the eye is being treated accordingly. So you don't have it, it's okay. You can try treating it. Because you can do it as a like diagnostic therapeutic treatment. You, know, you, you treat it and and indirectly you diagnose it that way. Because you treat it with an organ cycle, eye gel, it works. Maybe it is CMB. Okay, thank you. And next question. How do you perform the echo step in front of the slit line? It's tricky. Um, I like it when it's, it is the left eye because I'm right handed. Um, most of my colleague, my junior colleague, my younger colleague, they like to perform it when the patient lying down because they're not press diagnostic like me. I'm, I'm having some press diagnostic. But I still prefer doing it on the yeah, because I can see exactly where where the needle is going and, where, and the anterior chamber is shallowing, then I quickly pull it out. Um, I should show you. I'll get back to the slide that I to do. Okay. It looks easy, but it's actually not that easy, but with practice it should be fine. Um, I like to do it on slit length because I can control it. And if I want to draw more, I dare because I know where my needle is. So this is a right eye, which sometimes I don't quite like it. I prefer left eye. But right eye, you have a right eye. You see the patient in front of the sit there. Mm -hmm. You kind of wipe around the sit there, make sure it's really clean. Put, the spec uh, put some uh, provolone iodine, half gram on. Put the speculum on. You practice first. You turn on the sit there, everything's set ready. You position your hand. And you make sure that this hand is going that way. Mm -hmm. And the time you put, you, you push this way, and then you pull the time there off. That's for the right, right eye. Left eye is a lot easier if you're right handed. You pull from this way and then you plunge it to the other side. I don't think I can do it with one hand, put the needle in and plunge it out. No. Or alternatively, you can get your assistant to pull it. But I prefer to do it all by myself. So it's usually quite okay if you aim lower one third. You don't go that way. If you're really worried, you can constrict the pupil first before you do it. People who are myopic is a lot better. <laughs> you just do it. People with fake, pseudo fake it is even better. You don't have to worry too much. Yeah. So you, you try like you, 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 it's actually not that difficult, but it's just a bit of feeling. Um, as for I have a lot of colleagues who do it when the patient lying flat because nowadays we do intravitreal injection all the time. When they inject intravitreally, they also have to do anterior pass and pieces as well. So they're very familiar with that. Um, the only thing is sometimes you want to get enough aqueous. Uh, I'm not sure which which one you actually get more because sometimes. On the slit, you think you get enough, but actually it's not enough. When the patient lying down flat, sometimes you get a bit more bolder because you don't see the needle penetrate. So you draw a bit more. So either way, it will work. Yeah, it will work. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, how do you, uh, in a patient uh, that you plan for cataract surgery, how do you prepare the patient, say like a VIT patient, um, how long the patient should be on like steroids before, or like if the patient is um, quite um, not having symptoms for like more than three months, it's quite do you still cover with steroids and how long do you do it? And after the surgery do you still continue like steroid uh, system steroid oral first of all you need to know as long as I mean first of all you need to get to know this patient first. How bad previously the patient has presented with GVITs and how much 
ocular morbidity has occurred on this eye already. Because we need to know the pattern, how this eye behave. So usually if a UVA patient first comes to me with a cataract, I don't know cataract straight away. I will get to know this eye first and the patient first. Because you need to know how this eye will behave, how frequent this eye get an attack. This patient, whether this is a confined patient or this is a fussy patient, or this patient who is, uh, you know, tend to default. So all this, all this issue will come into play. Um, at the moment, I do it in such a way that whether this is a severe kind of posterior urethral or case or uh, anterior urethral or case. Nowadays, for anterior urethral, you know, those uh, regular anterior urethral, is the patient is a confined patient, the condition is stable for three to six months, not recurring. Um, I will usually start leave them on eye drops. That means I plan for a date, I get them to see me about two weeks before that or even a month before that. I start them on topical steroid first. Four times a day, three times a day, until the day of surgery. And then on the day of surgery, during after the surgery, I sometimes, if sometimes, not all the time, I get the anesthetist to give the patient a boost of 8 mg of dexamethasone. It's short acting, but it still calm the inflammation for me. Then I see the patient more frequent after, after surgery, keep the patient on two hourly eye drops, hourly eye drops, see the patient the next day, see the patient next week again, uh, monitor the eye pressure as well. Uh, for the one that has very bad like, sclerosis, uh, intermediate disease, like their chest disease, it depends. Um, if the patient has been stable for two or three years, you can cover them with your oral steroid, that will be fine. For patients that disease, tend to be a bit unstable, but it's as good as it can be. Um, you know what treatment is best. Sometimes, a few of them, I have them on IV metal prep. You come in, I give you IV metal prep the day before surgery, on the day itself, and the day after, a gram, a gram, a gram, and then they go home. Um, they're straight, like, they, before they come in, they're already on, like, let's say, 10.5 mm -hmm. million of steroid. Then I boost them with three days of IV metal prep. They go home, they come back to 7.5 again, because just to cover that period when they just have an operation. Some of them, they can have the oral steroid as well. Now, this is all right, no, not all right, but it's just that the way I am nowadays, I am more prone to using, using biologics. Because a lot of my UVA patients who have been through the steroid phase, they hate it, totally hate it. They do not want steroid. So nowadays, for cases where I'm, I'm still a bit worried about exacerbation of the condition by the surgery, I actually have them on a dose of infliximab two weeks before the surgery. And it so far works quite good. <coughs> That's how I've been managing. <coughs> so, yeah. can, can I just ask, uh, with regards to the case that you showed just now, where the scleritis is scleritin and the DKK for the yeah. surgery, um, what, what, what are your opinions about doing iris fixated IOLs for those cases? Do you think that that actually makes the uveitis worse? I mean, this is scleritis. <coughs> okay. Uveitis, inflammation of moving iris. Ciliary body, right? When I was doing my fellowship in Aberdeen, my fellowship man, uh, the director is Professor John Forrester. He totally hate the PI. Totally hate. He said, This is going to induce uveitis. You go and check the iris. I am the one that always be treating patients with iritis. And for no good reason, you go and do a laser and try to get the Yet the iris you will in, in, in ignite a lot of uh, iritis and autoimmune response from that. My opinion about that patient iris fixated, you can if you're bold enough. But for that condition, for that patient, visual prognosis is poor to start off with because at the back of the eye there's a lot of insulative changes. Uh, maybe the macula is uh, the macula is not very healthy. And the reason why I do that case is because he's developing narrow angle glaucoma already. The lens is pushing forward. If I don't do something about it, um, the patient is going to suffer from painful eye, uh, and it's going to go downhill. Uh, they might even need to inoculate the eye. So I do the cataract surgery just to prevent that from happening. And there's no point for me to put my eye on. If if the patient has a good visual prognosis and the condition is stable enough, yes, you can put the iris to set specific stuff. But make sure that you immunosuppress them and make sure you follow up properly. I am not against like you totally cannot touch his iris or you totally you, you or you can do intervention. I'm open to that. But as long as 
you take a precaution, you discuss that properly with patients, we all learn from mistakes. I have, I have a very specialist, even my, my fellowship director, once upon a time, he will tell us that you know, he was somebody that feels that putting an IOL on a GIA patient is okay. But years after he practiced, he turned back and said, no, no IOL, that's not the way to go. If you ask a lot of uh, pediatric ophthalmologists who deal with GIA, IOL is not an option. It will just make things worse. And it's true. It's true. So it depends. This, this being said, the, um, the alternative would be to ask a patient to put on contact lenses daily. Yeah, yeah which, it's not a bad idea too. Which, but I mean, in an eye that has, I mean, I, I've always wondered, the eye that's keratitis, some of them are on chronic topical steroids. It's, it's also a little bit tricky to... to well, it's, it depends how much restoration you want, but for, it, it's on a case-to-case basis. This patient cannot even look after himself. Okay. He's staying in a HGB flat. His sister has to come over three times a day to put eye drops for him. So I had to, I had to work out my eye drops accordingly. <coughs> Just three times is enough because you cannot expect somebody to come. And then he, he used all the defaulter. So it's very tough. Do you, do you mind if you just ask uh, about the AC tap again, about the timing of the AC tap? So the what what we believe on our end and belief is that the highest yield is when the patient can't see the acute attack. But do you do you still consider doing an AC tap, say a day later? It's, say in the instance the patient comes in the middle of the night and you see the patient the next day after someone has begun treatment, do you think that that still has a high yield? Is, is there still cells in the middle treatment? The, the two types of PCR, one is qualitative, one is quantitative. In SNEC, they also do quality, quantitative as well. I'm not sure how that works out. My experience is all with qualitative. So um, once upon a time, I believe that if I do it, I tap it when the patient is active, has the highest yield. Mm-hmm. Now I don't, I, I don't take that. Now I'm not, my mind is not strictly fixed on that anymore because I come across cases when they're quiet, I tap them, and then I get, a, I, I get a positive results. And I have cases that are so confident that this is a brain fire, I definitely going to say it's negative. So I know how to pass with the uh, Nowadays, the threshold of tap is actually getting very low because from our experience here, tapping is actually fairly safe, so we can go with it. Yeah. Thank you. Especially for the pseudophagic one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, Patients in the acute phase of ureactors, but for some reason you have to do a cataract surgery for the patients, like either the lens is too intermersive or something like that. You have to go in and you have to go in. So in that kind of situation, and uh, you do a cataract operation, you have a uh, option to put in the lens because the back is there and everything, and that's one thing. Uh, but will you leave the patient in free kick, uh, or would you put in a lens? The second thing is how would you control the inflammation after that? What's your preferred choice of treatment? Mm. Case by case basis. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I actually have yet come across cases where I really need to do a cataract surgery actually. Very rare. Very rare. You would rather to do it in a control fashion. The thing that you need to do in the, I, I mentioned just now there are three emergencies in eyes, right? One of the emergencies, yeah, I, I forgot to mention to you the other two. The other two is acute, acute endoclosure glaucoma. You had to act. And the third one, endophthalmitis, you know, endogenous or exogenous endophthalmitis. Ooh do something fast. Send the patient for vitrectomy or do something, inject intravitreal antibiotics. Those are the three emergencies. Emergency cataract operation, right. Not that common. If you really want to do it, you essentially, you have to bear in mind, just put it on the plate, discuss it with the patient and the family. These are the risks. By doing this cataract surgery, I can make things worse. You still want me to go ahead or, you know, you have to let the patient know what, what is expected. At your end, if you really need it, need it, and you actually know what the what what this condition is about, if it's not infection, if it's this case is infection, no, not infection. If infection, don't go in it. You just do your retractomy first. If it's non-infectious, and you really need to go in quick, you just pick the drug that previously worked best to treat this patient. Let's say this patient previously worked best when I give the patient IV without prep, and the patient tolerate it, I give that before the operation. If this patient on my cruiser works very well, having biologic, but having said that, not ma- many people nowadays use biologics just before surgery because there's, there's some contemplate and some people feel that it's not safe or it might it might pro- it might be uh, it might cause it might cause uh, it might promote infection and sort of stuff. 
but from my experience I do it carefully it is okay so you give what the patient you look back to the history what the patient do best what the treatment the patient do best give that to the patient or if you want you double it for your operation and then during surgery like you can do what I do and if you well, you can give a bit more steroid and do whatever you need to do just monitor the patient very closely if you need to IOL not IOL um, if it's a very inflamed eye, I won't put my IOL because they, you have always an option to do it later on. I know the capsule is there, you don't want to go in later on to put the IOL and your stuff. Um, if it's not too bad and you think you can get it, not get it. If you feel that this IOL is very important for the, the patient to function properly, you have to weigh the risk and benefit. I don't have a proper answer here for you. I'm, I'm not a good politician here. I'm just telling you the facts. You do it or not do it, there's no right or wrong. As long as patients know the possibility of complication, you know the complication, and you need, you are happy to write the right and take the adventure, adventure, it's okay. As long as you draw it down, you don't want to do a surgery and the patient turn back to you, ah, do you know you will turn out that way? That's not document things properly. But if you, if you can, Choose, don't do it in a cute place. It's no point. You just dress it up, yourself up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Could I ask a question about acute hypoplastic leukemia? Okay. About leukemia and uh -huh. uh, ocular involvement in the CTI. So I, yeah. I base this on the patient whom I'm seeing now. In fact, I just saw the patient this morning. I, I see that's a little bit difficult because I haven't seen enough before. So mm -hmm. this patient, she's about the same age as me, she's a young young lady mm -hmm. who got diagnosed with ALL mm -hmm. a month after she gave birth. Mm -hmm. And two weeks after she received chemotherapy, she woke up one morning at 4 a.m. complaining of extreme pain in one eye. And when we checked her that morning, she had a very low grade intuition the reaction and in fact was passed off by the UBATIS fellow as having just a low grade uh, intro UBATIS. <coughs> and started on some topical steroids. But she subsequently, over the next couple of days, developed quite significant detritus. And uh, after, after a week or two, uh, we saw a little bit of, well, primarily it was a detritus and some snowballs in the peripheries, especially snowballs in the bank, especially inferiorly. But she also had a little bit of a sheathing of the uh, retinal veins. And, uh, and her her this sort of, uh, became pale after a mm -hmm. Unilateral after about four to five, uh, four to five weeks, and uh, so now her vision in that eye mm -hmm. is uh, counting this. Yeah. So is is that at all a common presentation in ALL? Hmm. First of all, if a patient presented to me like that, mm -hmm. I want the oral infection first. Oh yeah. So we've, we've done all those things. We oh, the, the background. We we've done a lot more. Uh, we've done a tap and uh, we send it for cultures and everything. It all came back as negative. And in fact. Prior to that, she had that she had a mm. she had some episode of sepsis and the, the blood cultures came back something. So we, we did start her on very high dose antibiotics for that period of time, but there, there was no change and there was no improvement. It's hard to actually judge just by mm. history, mm. but uh, first of all, I did come across patient with leukemia with very bad sclerosis. Yeah, she's most sclerosis. The eyes are okay. although it's painful, powerful. but now it's just very white and quiet. Sometimes it's possible. Sometimes. Right. Sometimes it's posterior. I have a few posterior sclerosis patients of mine who are female. The eye wasn't that bad, but they complained of pain. Oh, no. yeah, and you look at optic this and it's quite normal. But, mm -hmm. you know, uh, but I'm not saying that this is the case. I don't know what's wrong, what, what happened to this patient. Um, so far, you treated the, the patient with antibiotic, right? Antibiotic high dose. And, uh, high, IV system so, antibiotic. Yeah, and the chemo. Correct. Like what Dr. Vasali mentioned yesterday, you have to organize your, your mind. Mm. So if your treatment is not working, was the this patient is this a manifestation of the leukemia or this is a manifestation of the treatment that the patient has received? Right. You know, you have to think about that. Is it because of immune suppression that causes the infection? Or the side effect from the medication that he has she has that caused that? Or this is a disease manifestation or the patient has a, a low grade if if antibiotic didn't work, try the other side. Try steroid. Have you tried yeah. that? Did no, it work? It's not on high dose. 
Well, to be honest, this isn't entirely my case. It's saying that by the I'm, I'm asking this because I, I was thinking maybe there be something else that we can do for her. Yeah. She's so young and she's almost entirely lost her vision in one night. I have a feeling it's useful in these okay. reasons, but I, I so, might be wrong. But you have to do the angiogram. You have to. Uh, oh, did yeah, you yeah, culture? Yeah, uh, culture the, the pictures. And, mm. Yeah, yeah, we did all the. They, mm. then you get the for me, it's. Is this is this? We call it the dilemma. You try to salvage the patient's vision. You give the patient high dose, the uh, high dose antibiotic. It doesn't work. You have no choice. You you can try a bit of steroid and monitor. Keep the patient in the ward and monitor her closely. Yeah. If the first biopsy didn't show anything, try again. Do a second biopsy. Doesn't work. Third biopsy again. Send the send the biopsy for histopathology. Maybe it's something else. Okay. Maybe it's the 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 leukemia get into the pictures or whatever. You, you, you just have to hunt around and ask for a second opinion, get the hematology to come on board, get the IV people to come on board and work something out. It's it's sad that you come across cases like this, but you also learn the wrong way. And sometimes you never found the answer and you lose the eye and it's painful. Yeah. But maybe years down the road you might encounter another case like that and then the answer might be there. You, you never know. You always learn. I, I, but personally, you try anti anti infective treatment. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, then try and use the press treatment. If it doesn't work, then you biopsy. Then you biopsy more, or you go back to the and maybe an antibody. Maybe your first biopsy didn't show. Your second biopsy didn't show. Right. But just don't give up. Okay. Don't give up. And uh, but and same time also, it's tricky and it's cruel. You also don't give too much expectation to the patient. Yeah. In such circumstances. Um, right. I have, well, I have another case later on that um, not exactly so the same way it's presented, but you know sometimes we doctors we we also need other departments to help us out to find out the answer. Okay. The beauty about this is you actually look after the eye from the front to the back, and you are competent. You you actually knows you know how this eye condition is going to other part of the body compared to your other colleague. Unfortunately, and you also have to be friendly for to all the other people from other departments. Yeah, friendly to for respiratory people, friendly to the infectious disease people, friendly to the rheumatology people. No matter how bad those people treat you, just be friendly to them, and that will work. Okay. okay. On, on, on the flip side, I just have one one short follow up question. Uh, Is there other, are there other more typical ways in which ALL would affect the eye that you see? I personally, I don't know. I don't know because I don't come across that many. I did come across somebody. Who have because this ALL they have not classification, is it? Just need to be very, very uh, I don't remember. Yeah, that's right. The classification is very confusing. Um, <clears throat> for I, a lot of time that the presentation about for I uh, yeah. talking about this hematology thing is usually the lymphoma crowd. Okay. I come across cases with leukemia that has very bad sclerosis. Mm. Um, apart from that, usually uh, their treatment causes infection. You know, we really doctor give patients the medication. At the same time, our treatment itself can cause certain treatments to create, okay. unfortunately. Okay. Okay. Alright, thank you. No questions? Uh, anymore? Do you want me to move on to the next talk? Yeah, unless I think I just want to go. We are 10 past 10 at the moment. I should finish by 11. So, we move on to the next one or do you want to take a quick break? I get ready to make sure. I totally veered away from the topic that Dr. Rupesh asked me to do.